Pastors Heart and Dominic Steele. And thanks for joining us, and Neville Naden and Kanishka Rafael are my guests today. We're talking Australia's Indigenous, the Christian Gospel and Reconciliation. But before we come to them, the Pastors Heart, and I wonder if you could help us get the word out about this program. That'd be great if you could by sharing us on Facebook, by letting a ministry peer know about this program and also if you're able to help us financially that'd be great you could go to patreon.com and sponsor us by i don't know five or ten dollars a month and uh, that would be terrific we would be grateful and you'd help us pay the little team that helped put this together now neville naden kanishka rafael thanks G'day, very dominic. much for coming in ne- neville, thanks dominic the uh, bush church aid uh, australia first indigenous officer yeah and yep. Kanishka, um, Dean of Sydney and also Chair of the Sydney Anglican Indigenous Ministry Task, Task Force. Force. That's correct. Um, Neville, perhaps we could start with you and the mm-hmm. Pastor's Heart and really just maybe you could just let it all out on what's been going on in your heart during this last month of heightened tensions on mm. racial issues. Yeah, it's interesting as you look and you know check out the media and all the stuff on Facebook and what's happening there. Um, obviously our community's hurting and they're wanting to get some, uh, they want to make their hurts known to the wider community and hence the reason all the protests have taking place. Um, and sadly, there has been a move to actually shut down some of those protests. Look, I didn't march and I wouldn't march because of the pandemic situation. Uh, however, hurting people or desperate people do desperate things. Mm. And in this situation, uh, it was an opportunity for them to highlight um, the, the high incarceration rates of Indigenous people within the prison system across this country. And uh, they took the opportunity and decided that they were going to highlight um, that particular issue. Mm. Um, and not only that, but also the stolen generation stuff, you know, children being taken away and all the other past injustices of, um, you know, people and slavery and, uh, you know, the, the taking of the land. And there's just so many aspects uh, of it um, that our people just thought that they wanted to highlight it again. Um, thankfully, there certainly hasn't been the... the uh, protests like they had in America mm-hmm. where there was a lot of violence um, that carried on. Uh, the organisers of the protests here in Australia um, wanted to do the right thing so people were asked to wear masks and social distancing as best they could. You know, It's a little bit hard when you've got eight to 10,000 people walking down the street together mm-hmm. to be able to social distance uh, in that situation. Um, but they did what they could. Um, and I, I get a little bit concerned that people were um, jumping up and down and crying out, you know, look at these selfish Aboriginal people across the country, you know. And I sit back and I think about it, well, here they are concerned about their lives, um, but when it comes to our people expressing the hurt and the failure of governments, both present and past governments, to address some of the issues, um, they're not allowed to do that. So, you know, there's a bit of a balance that goes on. Um, and. Uh, yeah, and you know, there's even been some, you know, were saying that the protests in Australia um, come from Marx, Marxist theology, uh, ideology, mm. which I get a little bit concerned that that basically shuts down any protests that people want to do. And so they're calling on the church, you know, don't align yourselves with these protests. Um, and, you know, for us, or for me, as I look at the protests that are happening, it's got nothing to do with. Marxism. Antifa and Marxism and stuff like that. It's just people who are wanting to express mm. um, injustices that are happening across this country. Mm. And those who are speaking that it's a part of Marxism uh, ideology are actually trying to shut down um, what's happening in terms of the protests. Mm. Well, so. let's hear from you about hurt. Yeah. Mm. Talk to us about that. How, do, how are you feeling and your people feeling that hurt at the moment? Thankfully, a lot of our Christian people, um, they're not hurting as much as those who are non-Christian. Those who have come to faith in Christ um, have realised that uh, everything that's happened over the past, God has allowed it to happen, and for what reason, we don't know. Mm -hmm. But we're okay with that because we continue to see that God is in control. He's still sovereign over all things. And when it's all said and done, there'll come a day when he'll 
iron it all out. And he'll sort. He'll, he'll sort the, bring justice. Yeah, too right. He will bring justice uh, for our people, and our people actually rest. Our Christian people actually rest in that. In saying that, um, there are a lot of our people who are non-Christians, and so they don't understand what's going on. It's these people that are actually um, saying, we want this issue addressed by the various govern governments of the day. And uh, I believe the church has got a role to play in it, mm. a big role, actually, in trying to help address some of those issues. What <coughs> role would you like to see Christian leaders play? One of the big issues for our people um, is that this land has never been ceded, Dominic, and there's been no um, conversation about uh, sitting down around the table and talking about how we can coexist mm. together on this land. Mm. You know, the First Nations people and non-Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And I think that's where the church can get behind it and say, look, let's lobby mm -hmm. the government so that conversation can take place. People are frightened and scared of um, this word called treaty. Mm -hmm. And treaty is just two or sovereign nations sitting down having a discussion mm -hmm. about how they can coexist in one space. Mm -hmm. um, it's not Indigenous people getting all their land back. Indigenous people don't want all their land back. Mm -hmm. But they want a better relationship upon which they can live together mm. uh, in the same space. There will be there will be some. There'll be yeah. some of the radicals that'll say, yeah, no, we want all our land back. Mm -hmm. But the majority of them don't. They want a better deal in terms of um, livestock. It is quite startling when you go to New Zealand and you just mm. feel with that treaty there how much yeah. better the relationships are. Yep. Yeah, no, and you're right, but they've had they've continued to struggle. I mean, they've got problems. But yeah, it still feels like it. Oh, yeah. Even though they've got problems, yeah. it is better. Yeah, yeah, that's right. I think the sad thing about our country is that governments previously have decided to bury their head in the sand and just hoping that everything's going to go away. And Do you feel, I mean, I felt like this. When, um, when that big apology from Kevin Rudd happened and, and then he announced that there was going to be a bipartisan committee, he was going to chair it, the opposition leader was going to be the deputy chair, and they were really going to move forward and do something. And I just had my hopes so high mm. for this was the moment where it was going to happen. And then it was such a spectacular, it turned out to be such a spectacular overpromise and yeah. and a complete flop in terms of delivery. Yeah. I, I was in Canberra for the apology. Mm -hmm. I flew across from Broken Hill and... It was amazing. Mm. Just so many people there, especially those that were taken away from their family, mm -hmm. um, they were in tears. Yeah. And uh, you know, you were there and you felt the hurt yeah. of your mob. And I, th and when Kevin did the apology, you know, it even made it worse. I thought, well, I don't know if I want to be. Well, well it made it worse in that people they were finally being listened to. Yeah. Did you feel it made not not so? I mean, I presume on the day you felt fantastic. But yeah. Then when. When there was no follow through, it was worse. Yep. Yeah. 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 But even on the day for me, it was worse because the mourning and the wailing that took place on the government, on the parliamentary lawns, I thought, this is crazy. You know, you, you just felt the hurt and the pain mm -hmm. that existed. And that for me, I thought, I didn't realise the extent of the hurt that a lot of my people were facing. Mm. Um, and so it was an experience mm. um, for us that day. Um, yeah. How has that whole stolen generation thing touched you and touched your your immediate community and your family? Um, not so much my family, because I I come out of uh, uh, probably a situation which is remotely different to a lot of my people. Mm -hmm. My grandfather was a native worker with the AIM, Aboriginal Inland Min mm -hmm. Missions of Australia. Mm -hmm. And so we were brought up in a Christian environment. Mm -hmm. And my dad bent over backwards to protect us from the racism mm -hmm. um, that existed in the community. Was it there? Of course it was. I remember going to school, you know. Um, where, um, just an example, you go to school. Um, no kid wanted to sit with you at, at playtime. Um, we couldn't go to school and take our Milo for the milk because back in them days they had those little milk bottles mm -hmm. and, you know, all the non-Aboriginal kids would bring their Milo and their quick and mm -hmm. put it in there and so they have flavoured milk. Us guys, nah, we're flat out getting a bottle of milk, never alone the, yeah. the uh, flavours. But so there was stuff like that, um, name-calling, boom, 
nigger, you know, and, and it's interesting that the word nigger is an American word, mm. but it's also been brought, a, it was used over here mm. um, in Australia. I can remember not too long ago, um, Kathy and I had been married now for 36 years, and I reckon about 10 years after we were married, every time we were to go on travel, um, we would stay in a motel, and I would, I would say, Kathy, you go in there um, and book us in because I, I felt really uncomfortable in going into a, the reception of a motel mm. um, because you knew straight away that, you know, pe I wonder what people are thinking. There's a ra racial profile. Mm. Yeah, well, you, you, even if there wasn't, mm -hmm. that's what you felt yeah. was going on. And so, um, you know, my wife can attest to this. Every time we'd go somewhere, um, who would go in to book us into the room? It would be her. Mm. Why? Because she's lighter complexion. Um, and she could be mistaken for being a non-Aboriginal person. Mm. And so um, she would do that job for us. Mm. So there's things like that. Um, yeah, mind you, I think I've done a lot of things that probably I shouldn't have done anyhow in, at school and stuff. Well, it's just you and me. <laughs> it's just you and me, Neville. Tell us what. <laughs> <laughs> I think we'll leave that one for another conversation <laughs> for another day. So Kanishka chairs the... Um uh, the Sydney Anglican Indigenous Task Force. Mm -hmm. um, you want church leaders to step up and speak into this debate. Yeah. What are you hoping that uh, he and the others will do in that area? I was probably the, I was yeah. probably one of the first recipients of that fund that was set up, the one point two million dollars. Mm. Um, I was the first guy on board out in Mount Druitt. We went yeah. there to plant a church, um, and so we did that for about eight years, I think, mm -hmm. um, working alongside Rick Manton, uh, and. It was great having those funds mm -hmm. and also involved in the setting up of the ministry where Michael Duckett is mm -hmm. uh, as well back in and the day. We should say we tried to get Michael here today yeah. and, he, and he was coming and then he ended up not being able yep. to come. Yeah. So we were I was involved in that as well. Um, but as in most ministries, uh, they're always in need of more resources yep. to do more. Mm -hmm. And I think the... Our, the, our Anglican Church in this country needs to take Indigenous ministry a lot more serious. See, BCA's, BCA's take on the whole thing is that they no longer see Aboriginal people as being a mission field, mm -hmm. but the potential to become a mission force. Right. And so they're all thinking about Indigenous ministry is to empower Indigenous ministers or Indigenous people to do ministry themselves amongst their own people and within the wider church context. Yeah. And I think the church in Australia, you know, I went to GAFCON 2018, yeah. I was over there with yeah, you guys, yeah. and that was, that was it was great, a wonderful, it? it was yeah. a wonderful experience. But as I sat back, I reflected a little bit on it, and I thought, you know, the church in Australia is so good at encouraging all these black nations of the world, mm -hmm. and yet they struggle to do that back on their own turf. Mm -hmm. And it'd be lovely if the same attitude was taken in developing Indigenous ministry back on home soil, um, the same way they do with all the other nations of the world. Mate, I thought I was home when I was at, over in Israel, <laughs> amongst all our black nations. I thought, it was awesome. this is heaven, this is I, heaven. Oh, yeah. I just loved it, being led in Jesus by our African brothers and sisters. Yeah, yeah. 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 Kanishka, let's draw you in. Um, and what's your pastor's heart in this mm. whole area? Mm, yeah. Sure. Well, um, uh, since I've come back to Sydney especially, uh, I've had um, the opportunity uh, to speak with... Uh, a variety of Aboriginal Christian leaders, uh, including Neville, um, who preached last year at, at the cathedral as part of our bicentennial celebrations. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, it was the centennial of the Bush Church Aid, in fact, uh, mm -hmm. which coincided with Sorry Day mm -hmm. uh, last year. It was the 100th anniversary of the decision to form the Bush Church Aid Society, uh, as well as being um, the 26th of May, Sorry Day, the day that commemorates the tabling of the Bringing Them Home Stolen Generations report, that, that those mm. two anniversaries now coincide as mm. it happened and uh, Neville came and preached at the cathedral on that day which was a great, um, it was wonderful uh, to have him and to bring those two parts of our history together and I think that's, um, I think you know that's one of the tasks that we have to recognise the history uh, which has good and bad mm -hmm. um, and of course we thank God for uh, so much um, uh, good for Aboriginal Christian leaders, uh, and uh, especially, and um, uh, uh, and all of that. But 
we've been poor. I feel personally, um, it's taken me a long time to really learn the history of Aboriginal people in Australia and to begin to understand um, the ongoing experience of mm. pain, mm. of grief, uh, of separation. Marcus Lode in 1973, speaking to the Sydney Synod, uh, s said amongst the consequences of the encounter between Aboriginal people and non-Aboriginal people, amongst the consequences, uh, uh, disease, um, death, the loss of culture, and he said this complex area of land rights, mm. uh, the language of 1973, mm. um, where uh, Western and Aboriginal culture have different conceptions of land. And he said, we think of land as something we own, mm. but Aboriginal people think of land as something to which they belong, mm. as though the, the land owns them. Mm. Uh, and um, now that was 1973, and that was Sir Marcus Lowe speaking in the Sydney Synod. Uh, and yet those kinds of ideas, <laughs> that kind of understanding, even that kind of understanding was quite foreign to me. Mm. Uh, so um, uh, coming to the role at the cathedral uh, has meant, uh, I think, people like Neville, uh, Ray and Sharon Minikin, uh, Michael Duckett, uh, mm. Auntie Jean Phillips from Queensland. And so it's been a tremendous privilege for me uh, to meet Aboriginal Christian leaders of many years' uh, service of mm. the gospel uh, with their own stories and, and as a result to be able mm. to begin to hear um, what this experience is and what the ongoing effects of dispossession uh, and uh, other aspects of, uh, of injustice really that Aboriginal people have experienced. Mm what the ongoing effects are. Because until you know that, it's hard to go forward. Mm -hmm. uh, the process of um, reconciliation, if we think about scriptures, and I should say there is a tremendous paper uh, produced by our Doctrine Commission, the Sydney Anglican Doctrine Commission has produced a paper on the Which theology we'll link of to reconciliation. Here. Yeah, great, do that. Um, and uh, it identifies, uh, you know, the kind of the, the levels of reconciliation that we encounter in Scripture, um, uh, God's reconciling uh, us to himself and himself to us, where he has all the initiative, as it were. But flowing out of um, that reconciliation, Ephesians 2, uh, speaking of Jew and Gentile, and the creation of one new humanity, uh, which is really a gift of the mm. gospel, Mm. Um, and so Christians of many cultures are reconciled in Christ. Mm. What we have to do is give expression to it. Mm. We, we have to live out the, the reconciliation that Jesus has won for us. And so in order to do that, the task force of which I chair has been asked to do two things. One is uh, to work out how we as diocese parish individuals can acknowledge past failure. Mm -hmm. Because in interpersonal um, reconciliation, that's the first step. There has mm. been sin. Mm. Uh, there is need for forgiveness and repentance. Um, in 1988, uh, Sir John Grindrod was primate and uh, Arthur Malcolm was Aboriginal bishop. Mm. And there was a meeting of bishops at the cathedral. Mm. This <laughs> and, is a lovely uh, story. Yeah. <laughs> And uh, as part of the bicentennial celebrations, uh, Sir John Grindrod, on behalf of the Anglican Church, all the bishops were there, and he spoke to he f spoke formally in the context of a service, uh, and said um, to Bishop Arthur Malcolm, uh, "We want to seek the forgiveness of God and the forgiveness of your people for the wrong things that we have done." And Bishop Arthur Malcolm said. Uh, we, want, we have been forgiven by Jesus. We want to forgive you. And we've also done wrong things and we need your forgiveness. That was 1988. And I think that was a high point, really, uh, in the Anglican Church. Um, and, uh, and that recognition, so the recognition of wrong, the seeking and giving of forgiveness, uh, that's, that's the foundation. So the first thing the task force has been asked to do is to uh, articulate how we can 
acknowledge past failure. Then the second thing um, is to suggest ways in which we can express together uh, in Christian unity, um, fellowship and ministry partnership. Uh, how do we move on from that recognition to sharing together in Christ and especially in the promotion and support of Indigenous ministry? It did sound, Neville, like you were pushing for a next step of the church speaking to the government on this issue as well. Oh, yeah. <clears throat> I think true. I think real change will happen when the government um, sees the need to address some of the issues, especially around land and building, you know. Mm -hmm. um, Can I say, uh, Sir Marcus Lane said that in 1973. Yeah. Right. Um, uh, the task force that was created just two, two years ago uh, has a very <laughs> defined kind of brief. Um, and, uh, so we're just widening uh, the terms so, of reference here. <laughs> that's right. That's right. Yeah. So, um, uh, so we've been given a specific task, which uh, we, we hope to uh, pursue, and it, it, it's a joy to do it, really. Uh, but as early as 19, at least as early as 1973, Sir Marcus Lane mm. in the Sydney Synod um, said we need to engage at the level of government, at the level of community, uh, and at the level of church. Um, uh, and uh, as fellow Christians, mm. uh, Indigenous and non-Indigenous Christians, uh, sharing together in the ministry of the gospel, bringing the gospel to the whole nation, uh, First Nations people and the rest of the na other Australians as well, uh, mm. and uh, promoting, supporting, equipping Indigenous ministry. Yeah. Mm. So we'll, we'll ask you about the work in rural areas in a moment, um, Neville, but can you, perhaps you could just give us a little burst of what's going on in Indigenous ministry in this city, Sydney, at the moment? Sure. Well, um, uh, Neville uh, referred to uh, a couple of the centres, so um, Christian Fellowship certainly in Mount Druitt and uh, Nara, um, at, at the moment still seeking uh, sustainable leadership. So people who've been doing things there for a long time are, are continuing to do them, but that, that they need renewal and support. Um, uh, Ray and Sharon Minikin out at St John's Glebe and the Scarred Tree Ministries. Uh, Michael Duckett, who wasn't able to join us today, uh, MacArthur Indigenous Church, um, Campbelltown Way, uh, and uh, the Living Water Ministry with Matt Patterson mm. at, uh, in Redfern. They're doing a good job. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So. Uh, uh, they're there. It would be great for people to know those ministries, to pray for them. Uh, I know some parishes have connections with some of those ministries, uh, and certainly that'll be one of the things that we'll be recommending uh, to the Synod, is that uh, parishes take the opportunity to form those partnerships. And look, just invite people to come and, and tell us. Uh, come and uh, share with us your experience, because I'm a migrant. I came to Australia uh, as an eight-year-old in 1972, um, it was a very, very, very long time before I met an Indigenous person. Yeah. Mm. Uh, and, um, and so I think as uh, Sydney Anglican Christians, we ought to be saying to our brothers and sisters who are part of our fellowship across the diocese, come and tell us your experience, because mm. actually we don't know. Mm. We haven't heard it. Mm. And we ought to think of that as a privilege and a responsibility, I think. Mm -hmm. the, uh, the history of First Nations people in Australia is our history. Mm. We're Australians. Mm. So the experience of First Nations people is part of every Australian's history. Mm. Um, the Anzac diggers are part of my history, yeah. <laughs> right? Um, I, I want to know those stories and we remember them and we celebrate them and we draw strength from them. Mm. And uh, we ought to be doing the same uh, with uh, hearing the stories of First Nations people, because mm. if I can put if I can put this respectfully, um, uh, we all uh, have an interest. We mm. we all benefit from those stories. They're they're part of the story mm. of Australia. It's our family story. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Mm. But without uh, uh, you, you understand what I'm saying. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah. Um, Neville, the Ministry of Bush Church Aid, and particularly your role as uh, Indigenous officer. What are your focuses? Um, we, obviously, Bush Church Aid works in a lot of remote and isolated locations. Yeah. We have a lot of staff that are working uh, on the ground in some of those locations. And 
many of them work in an area where there's a lot of Indigenous people. Mm -hmm. And so Bush Church Aid says not only do we want to see Indigenous people identified, trained and then sent out to do ministry, but we want to train our staff to be able to work with Indigenous people. So we've been working on uh, doing some cultural awareness stuff mm -hmm. and um, Unfortunately, we haven't been able to roll into that out at this point in time, but we will do that at our field staff conference next year. Um, and just helping them to think through, you know, culture, what is culture and, and how um, culture is important for understanding um, ministry within the Indigenous context. But not only... Uh, and the culture that lends itself to um, <coughs> uh, generational, intergenerational trauma... And that's the reason why a lot of our people are caught up in in uh, situations where they are. That's the reason why there's a lot of incarceration. That's the reason why there's a the lack of education for a lot of our people because of what they've suffered right from colonisation right through. And people say to our people, look, you've got to get over it. You know, what happened 200 years ago um, happened yeah. and you, you're not going to go back and change that. But there are things that we could be doing now to bring about um, some of those changes. But, um, so we're working with our field staff mm -hmm. um, across the country, um, and that's been curtailed somewhat as a result of you know, COVID, mm -hmm. and so I haven't been doing so much traveling <laughs> uh, these days. Um, but prior to that, I was going to different dioceses, speaking at different functions that dioceses had um, in regards to uh, some of these issues. Um, and so that's what we've been uh, doing. Uh, BCA uh, continues to um, fly the flag for uh, seeing Indigenous young people who have potential leadership. Um, and you're telling me you, you've got a few. There's a couple of, uh, mind you, we haven't identified them, but they've come to our notice. So we're going to, you know, we're taking them on board and we're supporting them um, somewhat. Um, there's a couple of more college, mm -hmm. a young man by the name of Jonathan Tavala. And we want people to pray for him. Jonathan's got a Pacific Islander uh, father and an Indigenous uh, mother. Mm -hmm. um, there's Lucy Wheeler from the Blue Mountains, you know, for, for all, from all places. She's, she's from there. Um, and Lucy's, and they're only doing the diploma of biblical theology at this point in time. Yeah. But um, And then we've got a young fella in Melbourne at Ridley College by the name of Lonnie Bendesi. And Lonnie's... Um, loved his studies. He's going to enrol to do the degree course uh, down at Ridley. And I look at that and I said, that's exciting because they are, that is the future of the church. Yeah. And we need, more, oh, we need more of them. We need yeah. more of them. I think at the end of the day, if we're going to see Indigenous people rise up um, and become leaders within the Christian church, some of them need a bit of a nudging. <laughs> and um, because at the end of the day, they don't realise that, hey, a, a ministry and a vocation in doing ministry um, is also something that they can do. Mm -hmm. um, they don't see that uh, the pathways into it. I remember the Archbishop uh, at the time, Peter Jensen, coming out to uh, Mount Druitt and he said to me, he says, I heard that uh, you got your fingers wrapped a little bit uh, with a particular person, uh, inviting him into doing some studies and so forth and so on. Um, and you got yourself in a bit of trouble over that. And I said, yeah, I said, I did. He says, because actually I committed the diocese, to, I think it was to $100,000. Um, and so he said, nudge me a little bit. And he says, can you make a few more of those mistakes? Um, and so obviously the Archbishop has got a real heart to see Indigenous ministry develop and uh, raised up within this particular diocese. Yeah. Um, and... I would just hope that all dioceses around the country could change their way of thinking in regards to how they see Indigenous people in ministry. Seeing with the potential to be able to rise up and become church leaders within the context of the Christian church right across this country. Because yeah. unless that happens, and unless we allow that to happen and encourage that to happen, it's not going to happen. Someone, yeah. say, well, someone once says, if you aim at nothing, you'll it every time. Right. And so if we don't have a desire to do that, it's just not going to happen. Yeah, well, Kanishka, thanks very much for coming in. Yeah.
My guests on The Pastor's Heart, Neville Naden, the uh, first Indigenous officer for the Bush Church Aid Society Australia, and Kanishka Rafael, Dean of St Andrew's Cathedral uh, here in Sydney, and uh, also Chair of the Sydney Anglicans Indigenous Ministry Task Force. You've been with us on The Pastor's Heart, and we'll look forward to your company next Tuesday afternoon.